This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 11 for June 5 to 11, New Covenant Sanctuary, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we open your word this week that your Holy Spirit can guide us. We thank you that Jesus came and lived and died as the sacrifice for each of us. And that as we look at our lesson this week, as we contemplate the Lamb and the cross, as we look at the new covenant sanctuary, we pray that we may catch a greater glimpse of your love, your care and your compassion for us and your faithfulness as well. And as we open your word, we pray that it will speak to us in such a way that we may be able to share it with others as well. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Let's read that again. Hebrews nine fifteen. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. A moonless evening. The sky, black like spilled ink, covered Frank in shadow as he walked the empty urban streets. After a while, he heard footsteps behind him, someone following in the darkness. Then the person caught up with him and said, Frank, the printer? Yes, I am he. But how did you know? Well, answered the stranger, I don't know you, but I know your brother very well. And even in the darkness, your mannerisms, your way of walking, your figure, all reminded me so much of him. I just assumed that you were his brother, because he told me that he had one. This story reveals a powerful truth regarding the Israelite sanctuary service. It was, the Bible says, a shadow of the real. Nevertheless, there was enough in the shadows and images of the earthly sanctuary to clearly foreshadow and reveal the truths they were supposed to represent, the death and high priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And so, for the week at a glance, the questions we'll try and answer. Why did God want the Israelites to build a sanctuary? What does the sanctuary teach us about Christ as our substitute? What does Jesus do in heaven as our representative? Sunday, June 6. Relationships. Our text for today is Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12. And I set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. One point should be clear by now. Whether in the Old Covenant or New Covenant, the Lord seeks a close, loving relationship with His people. In fact, the covenants basically help form, for lack of a better word, the rules for that relationship. Relationship is crucial to the covenant in whatever time or context. Yet, for a relationship to exist... There needs to be interaction, communication and contact, particularly for sinful, fallible, doubting humans. The Lord, of course, knowing this, took the initiative to be sure that he would manifest himself to us so that within the confines of fallen humanity, we could relate to him in a meaningful way. Question, read Exodus 25, verse 8, the Lord's command to Israel to build a sanctuary. What reasons does the Lord give for wanting them to do this? Exodus 25 and verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The answer to this question, of course, brings up another question, and that is, why? 
Why does the Lord want to dwell in the midst of his people? Perhaps the truth could be found in the two verses for today that we've just read. Notice, the Lord will tabernacle or dwell with them. He then says that he will not abhor them. He also says that he will walk among them and will be their God and they will be his people. Look at the elements found in these verses. Again, the relational aspect comes through very clearly. Take a few minutes. Analyse Leviticus 26, 11 and 12 and Exodus 25, verse 8. Write down how the various elements all fit in with the notion that the Lord seeks a relationship with his people. So let's read those verses. Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. And we'll compare that with Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. So to finish the day, focus specifically on the words, My soul shall not abhor you. What is it about the sanctuary itself that provides the means by which fallen, sinful people can be accepted by the Lord? And why is that so important for the process of forming a covenant? Monday, June 7. Sin, Sacrifice and Acceptance Our text for today is Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. The divinely appointed way for the Old Testament sinners to rid themselves of sin and guilt was through animal sacrifices. The Israelite sacrificial offerings are detailed in Leviticus chapter 1 through to chapter 7. Careful attention was paid to the use and disposal of the blood in the various kinds of sacrifices. Indeed, the role of blood in sacrificial rituals is one of the unifying features in the Israelite sacrifices. The person who had sinned, and thus had broken the covenant relationship and the law that regulated it, could be restored to full fellowship with God and humanity by bringing an animal sacrifice as a substitute. Sacrifices with their rites were the God-appointed means to bring about cleansing from sin and guilt. They were instituted to cleanse the sinner, transferring the individual sin and guilt to the sanctuary by sprinkling blood and reinstituting communion and full covenantal fellowship of the penitent with the personal God who is the saving Lord. How do these concepts expressed above help us to understand the questions at the end of yesterday's study? What prophetic significance was there in the animal sacrifice? Well, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 12, gives us some clues. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you 
make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And then in Hebrews 10 verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The Old Testament animal sacrifices were the divinely ordained means for ridding the sinner of sin and guilt. They changed the sinner's status from that of guilty and worthy of death to that of forgiven and re-established in the covenantal God-human relationship. But there was a sense in which the animal sacrifices were prophetic in nature. After all, no animal was an adequate substitute in atoning for humanity's sin and guilt. Paul states it in his own language. It is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Thus an animal sacrifice was meant to foreshadow the coming of the divine human servant of God who would die a substitutionary death for the sins of the world. It is through this process that the sinner is forgiven and accepted by the Lord, and the basis of the covenant relationship is established. And so to finish today, put yourself in the position of someone who lived in Old Testament times when animals were sacrificed at the sanctuary, remembering too just how important livestock were to their economy, culture and whole way of life. What lesson were their sacrifices supposed to teach them about the cost of sin? Tuesday, June 8, The Substitution Our text for today is Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. There is no question, one of the key themes, if not the key theme of the New Testament, is that Jesus Christ died as the sacrifice for the sins of the world. This truth is the foundation of the entire plan of salvation. Any theology that denies the blood atonement of Christ denies the heart and soul of Christianity. A bloodless cross can save no one. Meditate upon the text for today and then answer these questions. Did Jesus volunteer to die? For whom did he die? What would his death accomplish? Galatians 1 verse 4 Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Substitution is the key to the entire plan of salvation. Because of our sins, we deserve to die. Out of his love for us, Christ gave himself for our sins, as you've just read in Galatians 1 verse 4. He died the death that we deserve. The death of Christ as the substitute for sinners is the great truth from which all other truth flows. Our hope that of restoration, of freedom, of forgiveness, of eternal life in paradise, rests upon the work that Jesus did, that of giving himself for our sins. Without that, our faith would be meaningless. We might as well place our hope and trust in a statue of a fish. Salvation comes only through the blood, the blood of Christ. Look up the following texts. Matthew 26, 
Verse 28, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Hebrews 9.14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And finally, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. What do they tell us about the blood? What role then does blood play in the plan of salvation? We read in the book The Faith I Live By, page 100, written by Ellen G. White, It is not God's will that you should be distrustful and torture your soul with the fear that God will not accept you because you are sinful and unworthy. You can say, I know I am a sinner, and that is the reason I need a saviour. I have no merit or goodness whereby I may claim salvation, but I present before God the all-atoning blood of the spotless Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is my only plea. End of quote. And so to finish today, dwell upon the Ellen White statement we've just read. Rewrite it in your own words. Make it personal. Put your own fears and pain in there, and then write down what the promises contain there give to you. What hope do you have because of the blood of the new covenant? Wednesday, June 9, the New Covenant High Priest. The earthly sanctuary where God chose to dwell with his people centered on the sacrifice of the animals. Yet the service did not end with the death of these creatures. The priest ministered the blood in the sanctuary on behalf of the sinner after the sacrifice itself was killed. This whole service, however, was only a shadow, a symbol of what Christ would do for the world. Thus, just as the symbols, the sanctuary service, did not end with the death of the animal, Christ's work for us did not end with his death on the cross either. Study for today Hebrews 8 verses 1 to 6. Pray over the verses, ask the Lord to help you understand what is being said here, and why it is important for us to know it. After you are done, write down in your own words what you think the Lord's message is to us in these verses. Ask yourself, how do these texts help us understand the new covenant? And as it says, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we look at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 6, as we see our High Priest who is appointed there, as we see the excellent ministry that He has, We pray that your Spirit will guide our thoughts, that we may understand more fully both your love for us and what you put in place to seal that love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now 
he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Just as there was an earthly sanctuary, priesthood and ministry under the old covenant, so there is a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly priesthood and heavenly ministry under the new covenant. However, what were only symbols, images and a shadow, as we read in verse 5 in the old covenant, became a reality in the new. Also, rather than an amoral animal as our substitute, we have the sinless Saviour, Jesus. Rather than animal blood, we have the blood of Christ. Rather than a man-made sanctuary, we have the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man, in verse 2. And rather than a sinful, erring human priest, we have Jesus as our high priest, ministering in our behalf. With all this in mind, think about Paul's words in Hebrews 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And so to finish today, think about it. Jesus lived a sinless life on your behalf, died on your behalf, and is now in heaven ministering in the sanctuary on your behalf. All this was done in order to save you from the terrible final results of sin. Plan in the next day or so to talk to someone about this wonderful news, someone who you think needs to hear it. Work out beforehand, based on today's study, what you will say. Thursday, June 10, Heavenly Ministry. Our text for today is Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Study Hebrews 9.24, particularly the context in which it is given, that of explaining Christ's ministry in heaven for us after his sacrificial death on our behalf. Though much can be said, we want to focus on one point. The phrase at the end which says that Christ now appears in the presence of God for us. Think about what that means. We, sinful, fallen humanity, we who would be consumed by the brightness of God's glory if we faced it now, we, no matter how bad we have been or how blatantly we have violated God's holy law, have someone who appears in the presence of God for us. We have a representative standing before the Father on our behalf. Think of how loving, forgiving and accepting Christ was when here on earth. This same person is now our mediator in heaven. This is the other part of the good news. Not only did Jesus pay the penalty for our sins, having taken them upon himself at the cross, as we read in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, but now he also stands in the presence of God, a mediator between heaven and earth, between humanity and divinity. This makes perfect sense. Jesus, as both God and man, a sinless perfect man, is the only one who could bridge the gap caused by sin between humanity and God. The crucial point to remember in all this, though there are many, is that there is now a man, a human being, who can relate to all our trials, pains and temptations representing us before the Father, as you read in Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet 
without sin. And as we read in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What two roles does this text put Jesus in? And how were these roles prefigured in the earthly sanctuary service? I'll read that text again, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. The great news of the new covenant is that now, because of Jesus, repentant sinners have someone representing them in heaven before the Father, someone who earned for them what they could never earn for themselves, and that is perfect righteousness, the only righteousness that can stand in the presence of God. Jesus, with that perfect righteousness, wrought out in his life through suffering, as we read in Hebrews 2.10, stands before God, claiming for us forgiveness from sin and power over sin, because without these we would have no hope, not now, and certainly not in the judgment. Hebrews 2 verse 10 reads, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. And so to finish today, pray and meditate over the idea of a human being, someone who has experienced temptation to sin, standing before God in heaven. What does that mean to you personally? What kind of hope and encouragement does that bring? Friday, June 11. From the book Selected Messages, Book 1, page 257, we read, The highest angel in heaven had not the power to pay the ransom for one lost soul. Cherubim and seraphim have only the glory with which they are endowed by the Creator as his creatures, and the reconciliation of man to God could be accomplished only through a mediator who was equal with God, possessed of attributes that would dignify and declare him worthy to treat with the infinite God in man's behalf and also represent God to a fallen world. Man's substitute and surety must have man's nature, a connection with the human family whom he was to represent, and, as God's ambassador, he must partake of the divine nature, have a connection with the infinite in order to manifest God to the world and be a mediator between God and man. And then from the same author, from The Desire of Ages, page 357. Jesus continues, as you confess me before men, so I will confess you before God and the holy angels. You are to be my witnesses upon earth, channels through which my grace can flow for the healing of the world. So I will be your representative in heaven. The Father beholds not your faulty character, but he sees you as clothed in my perfection." I am the medium through which heaven's blessings shall come to you, and everyone who confesses me by sharing my sacrifice for the lost shall be confessed as a sharer in the glory and joy of the redeemed. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Read Romans 5.2, Ephesians 2.18 and Ephesians 3.12. What are they saying that helps us understand our access to the Father through Jesus? Romans 5, verse 2, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And Ephesians 2, verse 18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. And Ephesians 3, verse 12, 
in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. 2. Look at the second Ellen G. White statement given above. Notice how she explains the role of the mediator. When the Father looks at us, he does not see our faulty character, but Christ's perfection instead. Dwell on what that means and discuss it with the class. 3. Looking at what we've studied this week, ask yourself how you would answer this question. OK, so Christ is in the sanctuary in heaven, so what? What does that mean on a daily practical level? And to summarise this week's lesson. The old covenant sacrificial system was replaced by the new. Instead of animals being sacrificed by sinful priests in an earthly sanctuary, we now have Jesus, our perfect sacrifice. He represents us before the Father in the sanctuary in heaven, which forms the basis of the new covenant and its promises. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Boy Revives Dying Church and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. A Seventh-day Adventist church elder asked Alejandro to preach his first evangelistic series at the age of eight. We want to plant seeds, not to harvest, the elder told Alejandro's mother. The church was dying on Tierra Bomba, an island off Colombia's coast in the Caribbean Sea. Its head elder had resigned from the pulpit and left the church on the last day of the evangelistic meetings that he was leading. Church members were discouraged and many had stopped worshipping on Sabbath. Alejandro, who had preached since he was four, was scared to speak at the first meeting. But mother gave him a big hug and they prayed together. People packed the yard of a church member's house to hear the boy speak. Hoping to disrupt the week-long meetings, the former head elder organised his own meetings in his home across the street from Alejandro's site. He invited current and former church members to attend his daily meetings. People walking to his house saw the boy speaking as they passed by and stopped. Who is this child preacher? they wondered. Many stayed to listen. The former elder was upset to see people going to Alejandro's meeting and he marched over to demand that they come to his house. Come on, he told people, grabbing them by the arm. Let's go! Some people went with him, but when he wasn't paying attention, they snuck back to listen to Alejandro preach. This went on for several days. Then church members invited the former elder to the evangelistic meetings and he came. As part of the meetings, Alejandro visited homes of people who had responded to his appeals for baptism. During the first round of visitations, three people confirmed their desire for baptism. During a second round, an unmarried couple asked for baptism. Alejandro's mother helped them complete the paperwork so they could be married. A total of seven people were baptised at the end of the week-long meetings. Alejandro left Tierra Bomba happy. The church members also were happy. The church was strong and growing. Jesus triumphed, Alejandro says. And there's a lovely photograph of the smiling Alejandro here just to the left. Alejandro is a 10-year-old child preacher in Cartagena, Colombia, and he has led 18 people, including his parents and older brother, to baptism since he was four. Read more in this quarter's Children's Mission, downloadable at bit.ly slash children's mission. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Better Life Centre to train missionaries at Columbia Adventist University in Alejandro's homeland, Colombia. Mm-hmm. 
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.